All right. Thank you, everyone. Welcome to the Conservation Education Lunch and Learn series today. Um, the Education Lunch and Learn series, if this is your first time joining us, um, is a webinar series started about uh, three years ago. It's monthly, and every month we put on this free webinar over this time, and we're just really talking about what um, different conservation-based um, and, edu and environmental education-based practices and topics to really elevate the work that many of us do in education across the state and across the region. Um, so it's been a really exciting webinar series so far. We've heard from so many cool people, experts uh, sharing their expertise, their lived experience, and a lot of great learning, collaborative learning taking place. Today, I am very excited to introduce to you our speaker. Um, Lauren and I have known each other for a few years. We both, uh, we I feel like we met, I, we met under the guise of uh, animal environmental education and animal ambassadors, both working at a nature center. And I've always been so impressed by not only the care that Lauren has given to animal care and that ethical use, but also then that education hat as well that she lends of, of how can we work with animals to help um, increase our impact in education. So she's a perfect person uh, to speak on this topic. Um, so Lauren is an experienced animal husband uh, caretaker and a wildlife rehabilitation specialist who focuses her career goals on the intersections of wildlife and people. She holds a bachelor's in animal science and a master's of arts in environmental education. And so she's gonna be speaking us to today about the critical thinking on ethical use of live animals in education. Um, so Lauren, you take it away. If anyone has questions, like I said, put them in the chat. Uh, we'll get to them. I'll, I'll work with Lauren and say, you know, there's a, there's a question. And then there will be some time at the end of her presentation for some, you know, for some more good questions and follow-up discussion. But go ahead, Lauren. Thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you, Amber. Um, so yeah, I uh, currently work with Nebraska Wildlife Rehab. Previously, I worked with Nebraska Game and Parks. I worked at the Omaha Zoo and other wildlife rehab facilities um, in Iowa. And so using animals in education is something that I've done for the large amount of my career. They're an amazing tool, definitely a privilege to work with. Um, and so today we're just going to kind of talk about some basics of that, some best practices, um, just kind of bring up some ideas, ideas that are maybe not necessarily right or wrong, but just things to think about. Um, so we can just make sure that we're uh, always regarding our curriculum in the most ethical and um, you know, best practices fashion. But before we jump too far into that, uh, I did want to talk a little, little bit about Nebraska Wildlife Rehab and uh, where I work, um, because it's important. Uh, it's, a, it's a really great resource for people here in Nebraska. Um, we do have now a 15,000 square foot uh, veterinary hospital here in Omaha. It's just at the intersections of 97th and Q Streets. Um, and it is completely dedicated to the temporary care of injured wild animals. Uh, so it's an important distinction because we do not keep um, animals generally permanently here. Uh, I do have some box turtles that were um, abandoned pets that do live here permanently that we use for education. But for the most part, our animal collection is not um, staying here long term, right? We are rehabilitation uh, center that is looking to release these animals back into the wild. Um, kind of a common question is why would we do this? You know, are we interfering with nature? Um, looking at studies of our animal records for admissions for the past decade or so, what we find is 95% to sometimes even years of up to 98%, the admission of the animal is a human centered cause. Right, um, hit by car, caught by domestic animal, a uh, big dog or cat, um, you know, perceived orphan by a human, but was maybe really accidentally kidnapped, um, ingested pieces of litter or plastic. And so you can argue absolutely that humans are nature, and so it's natural causes. But the way that we inordinately impact the animals and the wildlife, especially in our urban centers, uh, we feel that we do have a responsibility to them and to mitigate some of those effects. Um, so because of that, and because the problem seems to be human-centered, we do really focus a lot of our uh, priorities on education of people, right? Because that's the, the preventative step. Uh, we can go out and 
fix up every animal in Nebraska, but the things aren't ever going to stop until we teach people about how we affect animals. Uh, and using animals is a really important tool on that. So who we are is uh, varied people, uh, a lot of animal care specialists uh, with a lot of dedicated education into animal husbandry. Uh, we do have a wildlife veterinarian that's dedicated just to our patients here at the center, um, some veterinary technicians, uh, rehabilitation specialists, and education professionals, aka me, it's me. I'm the professional who does education. <laughs> um, and I have some part-time people who help me uh, we do lots of different things from after school uh, programs for middle schoolers to we run a high school science academy. Um, I have a book club for adults, um, lots of different kinds of stuff. So going from there, we will jump into kind of what we're going to talk about today. Um, briefly, we're going to just get on the same footing about some common uh, teaching implications so how, what is, first of all, the philosophy or the understanding of anthropocentrism, which is a really fun big word. And then what is the concept of the hidden curricula? These are things that will kind of then instill uh, what I have to say and what I kind of gathered here about using live animals as an education tool, um, why they're helpful. Um, we'll get into some studies and uh, some peer reviewed research of how they can be a really effective tool. And then we'll kind of wrap up with uh, some best practices for animal ambassador use. Things to think about, not I'm not necessarily seeing like this is the Bible of what you should and should not be doing, um, but just things to consider in your own programs or in future programs um, that you may be involved in. So starting off, with that, what is anthropocentrism? So it is a very large word that basically situates humans as the species that are the only or primary holders of moral standing. Um, it also kind of posits that we are the most significant entities of the world. Uh, so superior to all organi other organisms, we kind of beget them in a, in a, in a sense. Um, it also kind of puts the human lens or perspectives and experiences as more significant than other species. Um, and another common theme in anthropocentrism is humans have an inherent right to manipulate, to own uh, animals or nature in general um, due to our species standing. So due to us, whether it's because of our intelligence or because of our, you know, double jointed thumbs, who knows, um, we have the power to manipulate or own pieces of nature or uh, other species and stuff like that. So it's kind of a, a nice graphic here I like to show, um, instead of this hierarchy, we kind of like to deconstruct that from anthropocentrism as more as a circle, right? People are more equal. Now, understanding that species are very different and they all offer very diverse, um, things to our ecosystem, but they're all important because of that, right? Um, a lot of times anthropocentrism comes into this like man versus nature thing, right? It's like, it should just be us with nature, right? Us working with nature, but it doesn't always, it doesn't always happen like that. Um, however, I do want to also say that it's not always a bad thing. There's some things that you can argue are very anthropocentric, um, but they're things that we do and for good reason. Uh, one example would be uh, safety, right? So a lot of organizations that I've worked with that have animals in a building, um, if there is a fire emergency, you know, nowhere really in that protocols are we worried about evacuating animals. If there's an immediate threat to human safety, we're focused on humans. We're focused on the staff, we're focused on guests, visitors, people in the building. Um, and so you could argue that's a very anthropocentric protocol to have. Um, but when we're talking about safety, you know, things are a little bit different. Additionally, um, sometimes when we are working with, um, as educators, with people um, with like poor economic status um, or who have a medical situation, 
they not not really be thinking about um, animals, right? Like if you're worried about where your next meal is coming from, if you are thinking more about, you know, if your glass isn't full and you're kind of worried about your safety and um, your security, you know, we're not going to really impress upon these people that they should be taking the time to like recycle, right? Because they might have access to that. Uh, they might just be trying to get through their day. Um, you could argue this situates the human lens over animals, right? Because it could be detrimental to a habitat uh, to not recycle or to not use sustainable problem, uh, uh, products. But at the end of the day, it's a privilege, right? And not everyone has those privileges. Um, so just kind of understanding an economic situation and how that affects people when you're educating them. Sometimes you're taking that anthropocentric lens as kind of a compassion tool. For the most part though, uh, when we situate anthropocentrism, we're talking about humans at the expense of other species. And so that's not generally always something that we want to teach to people. And we'll talk about examples of that. So the other thing I wanna talk about is more of a pedagogical, pedagogical tool. Uh, so pedagogy is just the science of teaching people. And sometimes as educators, we talk about this concept that's called the hidden curriculum. Um, and this concept was created um, by a psychologist, uh, developmental psychologist named Philip Jackson in the late 60s. And this term is kind of understanding that when we teach people things, um, how we teach, the things we say, uh, sometimes without even realizing it. So a lot of times, right, this is unintentional. Um, we're bringing across a, a culture or a way of this unspoken values, these beliefs and norms um, that is just what we're supporting, right? And sometimes that's good. Sometimes our hidden curriculum um, isn't always a bad thing, but we always just want to be cognizant of what that curriculum is. Um, what you know what unspoken values or beliefs or norms are we putting out there um and just thinking critically about them um and so i know that seems kind of ambiguous but we will break down now uh how that relates right to using animals and teaching so in teaching um oftentimes one of the things that kind of trips people up um or just happens and we just want to think about it is um, steering clear of the use of behavioral adjectives that generally pertain to people that cause like this negative cognitive bias, right? Uh, a lot of times we talk about these as being uh, anthropomorphic. So putting human traits on animals that aren't necessarily maybe there. Um, so my example always is like, sometimes, you know, I'm in front of elementary school students and I'm talking about snapping turtles. And one thing I try to be cognizant of is I want them to be safe around snapping turtles because they don't want to approach them and get hurt. But I try not to use words like aggressive or they might be really mean or they might try to hurt you because even though it's a it's very understandable perceived risk and we want to communicate this to children, um, there's this moral implication, right? Of like when we think of humans as mean or aggressive, um, like it's a bad thing, right? And so I don't want that to act, even though I'm not saying that explicitly, I don't want it to come across as I'm saying that animal is bad or has some sort of negative morals standing. Animals are amoral, uh, they exist. They're just trying to survive. Um, another one is like that they're really dumb, maybe um, giving stories where it just kind of like maybe situates the animals just not being very smart. Um, maybe saying, talk about how they were dirty, you know, it's, that might be true. They may be a very dirty animal, um, but just understanding what are we unintentionally communicating when we use those words. Um, so another one then is the visible husbandry um, that the people can see in the public. And then what is your organization's culture around your animals? Um, so kind of a big one with this is species specific, right? So you know, is it kept in a glass aquarium with like, you know, a hamster drip feeder and a basking rock you could buy at Petco? Well, maybe it's a corn snake and that's fine, right? Like we're potentially sending this message to people that they could go to Petco and get everything needed to keep a pet snake at home. And that's maybe okay. Corn snakes can be great pets uh, if you're ready for the responsibility of them. 
But are we keeping a rattlesnake in that same setup, right? Are we saying to people unintentionally that they could just go to Petco, you know, buy a basking rock and some like coconut mulch and go pick up a rattlesnake out of, out of the uh, middle of nowhere and keep it as a pet? Um, so just kind of think about what are your organization's thoughts and values on those animals? Um, do we want to encourage them as potentially being easy to keep in captivity? Um, do we want it to seem accessible to keep them? Um, how we communicate the animal's needs versus how they are treated is also something we just really want to think about. Um, so once again, it might be fine, but you might also want to just consider like a more uh, setup that kind of mimics their natural habitat um, and separate those learning environments from captive and wild animals. Um, Another thing to think about, um, like I said, is communicating the animal's needs and then how we treat them. So one time, like one example that I've done is I kind of trip up by mentioning that I will feed my animals, you know, maybe I'm eating lunch and I have an apple and I'll give my box turtles the rest of my apple core or something. I might be unintentionally, you know, giving this message that like, I'm giving it this animal food scraps. Like I'm giving them the less desirable part of my lunch, right? Which kind of all of a sudden puts in this power dynamic uh, expectation. It um, also just kind of another way that I could say that is I'm sharing my lunch. Sometimes I share my lunch with um, my office turtles and give them some of the stuff that I'm eating, uh, which can then project more of a message of the quality. Uh, one more example, and then I see I've got a question here, so I'll make sure to address that is um, one thing sometimes I'll talk about with classrooms is that um, like I I believe, so my family will um, hunt the animals that we eat for meat at our in our house. And so sometimes I will bring in the um, excess stuff that we don't use for our animals here. So like organs, um, legs, the hide and stuff like that. And I did that with the intentionality of saying, you know, I want to provide a sustainable and natural food source for our animals here at the center. But then you kind of have to cognitively think back, you know, critically think, am I, once again, is it a food scraps situation, right? Am I saying that I'm giving the less desirable items to these animals because they're somehow less than? Um, but it's not, it's a sharing situation, right? And, uh, an example of equality. So. Uh, for rattlesnakes, where do you keep them during the presentation so kids could not connect them with inadequate glass? Yeah, so we, um, I have never used rattlesnakes as an educational tool. Um, I would just say that my thoughts would be if you are using them to, um, yeah, just make sure that the tools you're using are safe um, and are things that are potentially like made for that and not really easily accessible. Uh, so a lot of times like venomous snake enclosures are going to just have a lot of safety features that you can tell like, okay, this person, um, is capable and set up for those types of thing. Um, once again, I think like in a glass aquarium is probably fine, but then what are we putting in there? You, you know, can we mimic the natural habitat or are we just putting it on, you know, a substrate where it's kind of set up like a pet snake? Um, and once again, I'm not saying that that's bad. Um, and a lot of areas too, also the public or guests cannot see where the educational animals are kept, right? And that's kind of a different conversation. But if you are in a nature center or aquarium or zoo where the guests can then go and see the animal after your presentation, just kind of think about how you're using that animal and how it's kept. And, you know, guests are gonna put those two and two together um, and they're going to maybe extrapolate messages based off of that. Um, and then, yeah, same thing it, to also like to a point, you know, we also don't want to accidentally bring across to people that they can illegally acquire animals that like we don't want them to take in wild animals in general. Right. Um, so things like rattlesnakes and stuff, they do need special permits for that. And so that also might be a really important talking point too, is if you're using a rattlesnake or you're using a migratory bird species, you know, it's probably good to bring up some literacy around um, the legislation in your state, um, federal legislation, permits for holding those animals, you know, um, be upfront with people. We hold this and such and such permit, you know, we have to do this 
so that people know that they can't just go out and get this animal for themselves, right? Because we're telling this, these people that this animal is really cool and they should like it and respect it. And if we're successful, um, you know, we just don't want that to actually transmit into them. Oh, great. I want one in my house. <laughs> um, we want them to respect them for the species they are and doing their own thing. Um, awesome. Great question. So um, once again, then also... We talk a lot about person first language, and this is where I kind of also like to talk about maybe thinking about using animal first language as well. Uh, so I, I trip up on this once again all the time too. I'll be like my turtles, uh, Nebraska wildlife turtles, but that interpolates like a sense of ownership, um, which yeah, maybe we own the turtles, but once again, are we perpetuating this hidden curriculum of anthropocentrism, right? Of we own this animal because we are dominant to them. So just think about maybe saying the turtle, this turtle, Susie, uh, if you want to name your animals, I'm not gonna get into the ethics of that. I, I think there's a, a lot of things where it does endear people to them. You know, you just gotta be careful, um, but it, 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 it makes the animal on an individual level, right? Once again, it makes the animal first. Uh, so yeah, saying stuff like that, uh, it just can kind of helpful when you're doing your programs. So, um, looking into all this, if there's all these pitfalls, why do we even use live animals, right? Because uh, they are a great tool. Um, and so I just want to kind of just address very, very briefly some of the research. Um, but I do want to say that this is a very limited scope, right? This is one slide of a bajillion studies that show how efficient and effective using animals in education are. Um, one of the big more recent pushes is um, the use of live animals in social emotional learning and empathy-based learning, right? So this is gonna be uh, more towards younger early development students, but not always, not necessarily. Um, and a lot of these, uh, a lot of the research is saying that these captive live animals can really enhance learning. It can strengthen feelings of empathy and compassion. Um, in students, it can also build skills or responsibility, like maybe if you are, you know, a traditional K-12 teacher and you have a, an animal in the room. Uh, there's a lot of really good research that says that that can really help your students in a, in a, a plethora of ways. Uh, so learning more about their social emotional skills through understanding the lens of another animal, right, is, is a really good tool. Um, we also find in research that empathy towards animals a lot of times turns into environmental stewardship. Uh, lessons with live animals reported more behavior change in a lot of different studies versus interpretation only programs where an, a live animal was not used. Um, I mean, there's just, there's the power, right, of seeing that animal, you know, eye to eye, seeing how it behaves, how it moves, and there's an appreciation that grows from that. Um, so there's also, it kind of gets into Piaget's theory of development and learning that really suggests that, once again, especially in younger minds, younger students, uh, less than maybe like eight years old, they have more of an ego-focused mind, right? They're still kind of sitting in themselves. They're thinking from the lens of their own, their own being. Um, so that's just where they are developmentally. And animals can be a really great asset to introducing alternative or contrasting views of the world, right? Kind of that like in their shoes scenario. Um, just giving that initial aspect or aspect of like, what is it like to be another animal? Um, cause it's different. It's very different. It turns out, uh, additionally, it also just boosts our effectiveness as educators, right? So, um, particularly there's a study done of college students who were giving presentations using live animals. Um, and a lot of great stuff was reported such as them feeling less public speaking anxiety. It can increase their presenters overall confidence. Uh, it promotes flexibility while teaching. Uh, I'm sure a lot of us have been in the situation where you're, you know, holding a snake or a critter and then it poops. And now we're going to talk about the magic of the digestive system. Uh, so working with an animal or a coworker who can't understand you and doesn't always go along with you uh, could make you really flexible in your presentation performance. Um, and it helps create a positive, really comfortable learning environment uh, for people. Uh, most of the people like animals. Even if it's something that kind of weirds them out, like a snake or a tarantula, 
by the end, there's uh, there's a connection, right? It's another living thing. It's a, a bi you know biophilia, the love of other living things. It's 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 a powerful force, um, absolutely. So now that we know why they're such effective tools, I'm just gonna chat a little bit here about some best practices for using live animals. Um, and once again, I'm not saying this is like the Bible of what you should and shouldn't do, but it's just things to think about, right? Once again, that's what critical thinking is. Look at your protocols, look at what you do now. How can we do it better? So first of all, husbandry, right? How we treat animals and furs, how we teach about them. Um, so just, you know, it's always good to just take a look annually at your practices. How are the animals housed? Even if they're not in the public eye, you know, how we start to feel about them and how we treat them is it's going to work our way into how we educate them. Um, check in with them. Is there new science? Is there new studies that show uh, how this animal is kept? I remember a time even in my life when, for example, box turtles were fed a pretty herbivorous diet. Um, there's been a lot of studies, especially local out of UNL, that say like re regionally, you know, our, our ornate box turtles are pretty carnivorous. You know, they are omnivores. Um, but they eat a lot of insects. They eat even baby mice. They eat, you know, ground dwelling birds. Um, and so that affects, you know, how I, I treat my educational animals. I want to make sure that their diet is mimicking what they would eat naturally in the wild, because um, that's just going to keep them healthier. Um, additionally, um, sometimes, if you're not at like a zoo or something, husbandry might not be the top priority of the animal, right? If they're used as an educational tool, um, just make sure you know who is physically responsible. Um, it's not just like sometimes with a shared office culture of like, oh yeah, we just all do it. Um, it might not be a top priority because everyone's just thinking the other person fed it or changed their water, right? And so it's good to just have someone identified that is it a committee, is it a team, is it an individual uh, who's looking out for the welfare of that animal? Check in annually, look at your protocols. What are we doing? What can we do better? Um, and then additionally, we want to always make sure we're limiting animal stress, especially when we're in front of a, a group or a presentation and make sure that as an educator, you understand the animal's basic behavior. Um, if you don't have a relationship with the animal, if you've never held it before, if you've never worked with it, like it's probably a good idea to spend a little time with it um, before your presentation. People, even people who aren't familiar with that animal, they can tell when that animal's stressed out, when um, it's a negative interaction and it makes them uncomfortable. So we don't, we don't wanna taint the overall message that we're trying to impart. Um, you know, the worst thing that happens and it happens is like, you know, you get bit by the animal while you're holding it and teaching about it. Um, and that can be seen as negative. So just make sure you try and limit the animal stress, um, tune into it. Is it looking like really stressed out? Does it need a break? Uh, we have tools available to assess that. Um, and then the other thing too that I always find just really important is to intentionally train staff on safe handling and natural resources. It's really easy to assume that like, oh yeah, you worked at a zoo before or you did this before that they just know how to do that. Uh, but you always just want to check in, you know, have they worked with the species? Have they practiced holding it? Do their protocols of how they previously worked with an animal align with yours? For example, like, do you allow other students to hold the turtle or can they just touch with two fingers? Um, just make sure you check in on those touchstones for your organization. Um, hey, Lauren. So another good thing, too, is um, I can't remember if I'm jumping ahead on this, but Sometimes the people who teach about the animals are not the ones who take care of them. And it's always good to give the educators a little background knowledge on how we take care of them because people are going to ask, right? They're going to say, where does this animal live? What do you feed it? Um, and it's always good to just be prepared with those answers um, and what we do. And, you know, this is our best practice of what they eat. Um, if, the, if the educator is not as familiar with how the animal is kept, uh, they're just not going to be prepared to answer those types of questions. So another really great thing to focus on when you're using animals as an education tool um, is that they're individuals, right? Um, a lot of times we teach about a species and we're teaching about the species, right? We're talking broad strokes. We're talking about adaptations over, um, you know, generations and generations. 
But it's always good to come back to the fact that also um, animals are individuals too. Right? They're just as unique as humans to humans. Um, because a lot of times the, we can un, right, the hidden curriculum then is like this animal should act this way. Uh, another example that I have is like a lot of students are taught in schools. When you talk about nocturnal animals, they sleep during the day and they're up at night, right? That's what they're taught. And so when we say that and we beget their individualism and we just say this is the whole species, you know, this is how they, what they do, we instill this bias that when we see a nocturnal up, an animal up during the day, like something's wrong, right? Uh, we get calls all the time. <laughs> Nebraska Wildlife Rehab, the raccoon in my yard. Okay, what's wrong with it? Well, it's the middle of the day. Like, obviously it has rabies. Yeah, sure, that animal could be sick, absolutely. But your mind should not jump immediately to this nocturnal animal that is up during the day, like is diseased, right? Uh, especially this time of year, you know, Animals got a lot of stuff to do. They got a lot of food to eat, food to cash, shelter to find, um, and they might not get that all done during the night. Um, so we don't want to accidentally teach these kind of cognitive biases of like all animals do this. Um, so what I like to say is nocturnal animals are most active at night, right? They can still be active during the day. It's not as normal, but it's also not not normal. <laughs> uh, we don't want to teach about uh, species in broad strokes of like all animals are like this because animals are different. Um, yes. Love, I'm just sorry. I love the idea of a raccoon's uh, to-do list is running over and yeah. there's kind of stuff to do just like that's like a human, like that's a thing that we encounter too. So it's In okay. the spring Maybe too, they... because, you know, sometimes those mamas, they got babies to feed, so they oh. got to feed themselves, like they, they got a huge agenda and they're yeah, not going to get it all done. Do. I, love, I love how you phrase that. <laughs> and I think it's a really cool way for you to, again, like center um, center the animal's experience when you're teaching. You know, they've got lots to do. I don't know. I just love that. Yeah, thing. exactly right. Um, it kind of puts it in that focus of thinking, relating it to you. We're all human beings, you know. Um, we're on equal footing, and we we have a lot of similar experiences for sure. Um, I do also want to point out that individualism is not the expense of a social nature. So a lot of times when we talk about individualism in psychology or philosophy, you think of like a hermit or someone is antisocial in nature. Um, but a lot of animals are very social, but they're also still individuals. Um, so additionally, with that then is thinking about growth mindset. Uh, animals are intelligent. Um, animals have the capabilities to learn as an individual. Once again, a lot of times uh, I catch myself, I'm talking about adaptations. You know, this fox adapted to be red to camouflage him with his environment, um, but also individual animals are able to learn things in their lives. Um, and that's that's really important to make sure that we communicate to people. Um, a really great book, if you're interested in animal intelligence, is Are We Smart Enough to Know How Smart Animals Are? by Franz de Waal. Um, it's, it's a really good scientific approach to individual animal learning, um, and then some really good uh, examples in the literature about what they're able to learn about. Um, it's not always just for survival. Sometimes it's things like play. Um, and then also relevancy, right? This is a big one. Um, so environmental education that people can relate to is more impactful. Um, if people feel like it actually is going to matter to them, that it's going to affect them in their daily lives, um, it's, it's gonna, it's gonna help. It's gonna be more effective. Um, so we want to make sure that we, we make this animal relevant to other humans by understanding the animal lens or perceptions. Once again, we have a lot of experiences that are similar. We have a lot of experiences that are different. Um, this is a, a, a big topic we could talk about for hours and hours. Um, but anthropomorphism, right? So like giving human traits or characteristics to animals. For a long time, that was like a huge no-no in the world of environmental education. Think about maybe a certain amount is okay, right? Once again, when we're working with really little kids, you know, you don't want to be like, if you were a turtle, what would you do? Because we could never be a turtle ever. That, it, it just, we can't even think about what it would be like to be a turtle. But how can we use little bits of that? You know, like if, you were a turtle in a certain aspect, what, what would you do? Um, what would you feel? And it, that, can, that can help us relate to the animal, right? It can relate 
humans and our struggles and experiences to what animals experience. Um, so we can never understand being other animals, right? But using a small amount of that in their shoes thinking can just help learners understand how animals may approach decisions and then how they also are impacted by their environment. Uh, a good way to think too, if you're a biology person, is uh, teach with a, with a symbiosis in mind, right? Um, don't just talk about, you know, what we do for the animal, but what can animals do for us? Make it a two-way relationship, right? Because if it's a relationship, it's, right, we're relating to them. We're making it effective. We're making, we're saying, you know, raccoons are awesome and here's all the things they do that is cool. And here's also how they help humans. Uh, here's how we can learn from them. Here's maybe a medicine that came from, uh, from them from research that really impacts human uh, human life. So the very last thing I just have to remind everyone is that animals are just one tool in our toolkit, right? Um, so just kind of be cognizant of not using them as a crutch. Um, try and think of your lessons as a holistic environment, right? Where you're using lots of different um, awesome tools, uh, gamification or, you know, activities, uh, inquiry activities that really stimulates uh, like STEM thinking or um, like the science literacy process. Uh, using sensory biofacts is really helpful, um, especially for younger students, just being able to touch or feel things. Um, yeah, think about a well-rounded program um, and try and make sure to animals are just one of those pieces. Um, and with that, that is the end of my presentation. So I do have kind of a list of some of the references that I talked about um, here, if you're interested in looking further into some of that stuff. Um, but with that, if anyone has any uh, questions, go ahead and drop them in the chat. Thank you, Lauren. That was excellent. So many uh, topics that you brought up that I just wanted to like pause and chat for 10 more minutes about each one. <laughs> So that was yeah, really yeah. I like the lens that you uh, came here today with this topic. Um, there's just a comment. Uh, but before I read this, yeah, please, if anyone has any questions or thoughts, um, we do have some time if you'd like to, to share. I'd also be curious um, if anything from Lauren's uh, presentation today, did anything stand out to you that may be uh, a new way of thinking of things? Is there anything here you heard today that might um, help you reflect on your practice with education animals? So, um, yeah, if, if that jogs anything for anyone, please feel free to kind of throw that in the chat because I'd be curious to see. Meanwhile, uh, Colin mentioned Dewal has a very good discussion on anthropomorphism and its opposite anthropodenial, ooh, as he calls it. Um, in that book that you mentioned, Are We Smart Enough um, to Know How Smart Animals Are? I'll link that book too in the follow-up resources. Um, a critical thinking-based middle ground that avoids the extremes of too much or too little. That's interesting. Have you, do you, you read that book, Lauren? Did you, do you remember this? Yeah, there's definitely like some types of thinking where we, yeah, like we deny or we really reject the thought that we are like animals in any way. Yeah. Uh, once again, it's separating a man versus nature, right? Mm -hmm. And that's kind of where that anthropo, anthropo denial comes uh, comes in. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, we're, it's everything's a spectrum, right? So many little things are black or white. Um, so yeah, we are like animals in some ways and we're also not like animals in some ways. Um, so yeah, middle ground, absolutely. I for sure agree with that. I think that, I think the, the topic of anthropomorphism within environmental education could be its own lunch and learn. It's so much to unpack because you're right. You mentioned for so long, like when we were in our training, it was very black and white. Do not even name. I, I remember working in a zoo and it was like, don't even name them. Don't do, you know, uh, we, we are very scientific. We have to talk about the species, but at the end of the day, a lot of um, research and also like feedback and movement of how we build relationship, how do we use empathy as a tool, a lot of that is, um, like what you mentioned, Colin, a lot of what our earlier teaching was maybe that anthro denial. And so we've learned that, um, and especially also different ways of knowing, right? So as we are thinking about doing much better at integrating different ways of knowing into our practices, for example, in the indigenous worldview, 
uh, animals are relations. And I mean, I even share that, right? Like animals are, are our relatives. And so what's that middle ground look like? And if we're, if we're denying them an individual or an identity or like, it's just a snake, it's a bull snake. Um, yeah, what, what, are we, what are we missing there for fostering that relational building, especially with early children, like you mentioned, Lauren, that, ch that child development of what's happening in those early years, everything they see is a relational building thing. You know, they, they understand the world through the relation to them and to them only. So, so I've actually pushed a bit on, on that. Uh, I've, I've said in some presentations, I give you permission to use a little anthropomorphism and, and especially with young children and relate them. I, I could talk a long time on this, but thank yeah, you. Can I jump it's, it's, in real quick just yeah, to, yeah, 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 yeah I thought, good. yeah, my, my perspective here is a little different than it looks like for many of you with your roles there. And I just wanted to say, I'm thrilled to see uh, what you just mentioned, Amber, and of course, your your presentation, Laura, and I plan to share this recording with my environmental ethics class, because of course, not surprisingly, in that sort of course, you are talking a lot about anthropomorphism and challenges, but it's great to see that you frontline workers uh, and uh, educators in this, um, it's part of your own thought process. Mm -hmm. And this is something you care about and you're implementing. It's not just some abstract academic uh, topic that's interesting. And so I think my students will really find that interesting. And just personally, I'm really gratified to hear that. That's, that's awesome. And I do think it's, you can go too far either way in the way that you guys mentioned and DeWall, you know, he gives examples of tickling chimps, you know, he's a primatologist. So that's kind of his area. And he <laughs> talks about when you're tickling them and, and how it's not necessarily wrong to say, Oh, they're laughing. You know, that's not a human emotion per se, but um, he'd say it would not be very good critical thinking to not make that connection, but to talk about, ant queens and slaves mm -hmm. and workers or kissing garamis right that that is taking it too far the other direction mm -hmm. when there's not a good reason so that's why i said a middle ground it seems to me that's a really sensible and species-based you know discussion and that was I'm so glad to hear you're talking about individuals that's one of the things that we try to get to in environmental ethics is you can't make or you shouldn't make as a good critical thinker right generalizations about you know all animals or even most of them you really should be at least making species distinctions if not individual ones and so it's just wonderful to hear that all of you or a number of you are doing this as well so uh, thumbs up really really great presentation Awesome. I appreciate that so much. Thank you. Thanks, Colin. Yeah, these are the type of topics, Colin, that I do feel like the things you're speaking to are like on this edge, like we're moving towards. And so I think a lot of our, the, us practitioners are spending some time thinking about, you know, environmental education as an evolving practice. As we know more and understand more, how are we integrating that into our practice? So, yeah, um, it's excellent. Thank you so much. Um, and yeah, Lauren. If you want to address Jesse's question about yeah. the alternatives to sharing behavioral adjectives. Yeah, let's do it. Um, I definitely want to say that behavioral adjectives aren't like a no-no necessarily, but just thinking about which ones you're using. Um, this is one where I might interpolate once again that uh, animal lens and like kind of in their shoes thinking um, and be like snapping turtles um, have a lot of abilities to defend themselves. And the story can might be like, what do you think he uses to defend themselves? You look at the snapping turtle. Uh, he has, you know, a sharp beak. He has sharp claws. Um, yeah, you're right. He can use all these things to defend himself. Then you're teaching the kid, you know, about what are the inherent risks of, of snapping turtles, but it's not necessarily uh, towards them, right? It's not like you're we're not accidentally teaching them that snapping turtles might go around attacking little children uh but if they're defending themselves they might find themselves in, in that situation um yeah, and so you know, just thinking about those negative behavioral um adjectives some of them are fine you know some of them i'll talk about this turtle's very sleepy today or something um but just what are we yeah what is the unintentional lesson that we're saying with some of those uh, just kind of thinking about those that's good I, I often um, hear this question from every kiddo when you're holding a snake or any other animal, does it bite? And I don't know, Lauren, you can help uh, help craft my practice, but often I'm saying, well, anything can bite. Even I can bite. You can, like, we, we all can, can bite. We have the capability of it. I think what they're asking is, 
will this one bite me? And so then I speak to, you know, this one's really calm right now. It's our ambassador. We treat it really well. So I just kind of, but I don't know, it's, it's kind of a similar thing. It's like this very common question. Does this bite? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And just kind of think about like, sometimes too, I'll ask the kid, like, why do you think it would bite? Mm. Or is it coming from fear? Mm. Is it coming from a prior experience? Because sometimes understanding like where their motivations are behind those questions can kind of help you address those as well. That's um, good. Yeah. I, I also, I'm just like, well, it has a mouth and mouths are sometimes, yeah. <laughs> that's a function of the mouth. Yeah. Um, um, yeah. We just want to, once again, not ever potentially say that all species do this thing. Right? Mm-hmm. All nocturnal animals sleep at night. All mm-hmm. herbivores only eat plants. Like there are exceptions to everything. Um, so yeah, all snakes can bite. Will they all bite? No. Uh, just thinking about those things. That's really good. Um, and then Sean mentioned, these are also great examples and teachings for when you're trapping wild animals, especially when you're using the trapped animals for short-term education. Yeah, I, I, I'm i a huge believer in that it's using animals as a privilege. You know, I've, if you're using animals and you're teaching about them, you probably like them and are passionate about them. And so just making sure that we're owing it to them to do this in the most responsible and respectful way is I, just one of our responsibilities, I think, as educators. Excellent. Yeah, any other thoughts or questions from anyone? Anything else stand out to you? Uh, about what was mentioned today. One thing, Lauren, is a few slides back, and I can't remember, so it's okay. You don't have to find it. But um, like you mentioned, being up to date on the best husbandry, and then you said specifically there's some understandings of Nebraska box turtles, so even regional husbandry and how they're eating a lot more protein than what we thought. I guess I'm wondering if there is best uh, a best resource or practices, is there any kind of like consistent information that people can then reach to or go to to understand how to incorporate that into their husbandry of what what other what N- Nebraska native animals they might have? Yeah, that's a really tough one because there's yeah. a lot of information out there and it's like deciphering whether the information is good information uh, is mm-hmm. tough, right? So I always go um, to Dennis Ferraro, who's our state yeah. herpetologist, <laughs> it's like my go to like call a friend, but I wish there like Dennis was operationalized for like, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. all that knowledge, but yeah, local experts are definitely going to be helpful. Um, national organization certification agents like uh, AZA, the American Association of Zoos and Aquarium um, is a good one. They do have uh, protocols that are public for animal bastard guidelines on their websites. A lot of it is stuff you might not necessarily have. Like um, what was that resource? Animal- Sorry, Lauren. Yeah, sorry. So on the AZAs. Okay, AZA. Okay. Yep. Okay. Um, and they do have public some of their animal ambassador guidelines, um, and then they also have public the template for making those guidelines, and then the kind of the questions they ask in those committees to create them. So I have used those resources um, just to kind of in my own like what questions am I asking? What am I researching? Um, but otherwise, yeah. I mean, just looking at what new research is coming out because there's so many species and then how we keep them in captivity and how we take care of them you know it's just it's it's constantly evolving um just because there are so many so many species so if there is a new study out on um you know keeping fox snakes or something or what's going on with them um it's just always good to be on top of that and how it's going to affect uh your practices with your animals in your in your collection I think it's just really a cool um, topic to bring up because if you're in a situation where you do have someone kind of in charge of your animal husbandry, uh, a lot of times we think of that's just that care and maintenance and going to the pet co and getting the things and feeding on the Fridays. But maybe a additional job duty to kind of think about is having that person really own, um, you know, being on the lookout for latest information on these animals, you know, and just being up to date on that. Yeah, it's, it's good. It can be easy to get stuck in a practice. You know, it's working. My animals aren't getting sick. Why would I change? Um, yeah. Always kind of consider that. Uh, I good. liked your comment, Taylor, about, yeah, same thing with like sharing your kill, like your organs and stuff. Just making sure we're not somehow s- coming in across as like the refuse, right? Or the like lesser parts of the deer. It's always just important just because I don't really like to eat it. Um, you know, I want, I want to make sure that as an educator that I'm 
I'm sharing this as a food source, right, as an equal, um, and not that I'm like giving away fruit refuse or something. Um, so yeah, just kind of cognitively thinking about that and like how are how are kids maybe interpolating that, uh, especially um, in in ways that we are unintending. Um, but yeah, for sure. Excellent. Well, thank you so much. I'm not seeing any other questions. Um, but thanks everyone for your questions and discussion. It was really good. I do feel like this topic could have a lot more like <laughs> offshoots of presentations on it. But thank you so much for at least starting us and getting us maybe curious about some of the things you said. And um, hopefully we can learn more about them on our own. Then um, I will pass along uh, any information that she shared today, any resources. I'm going to put that in the email along with the recording and a survey evaluation for the series. Um, but again, Lauren, that was Excellent. That was one of, Yay, that was one of my good. favorites this year. Um, Colin one last thing I'd, uh, sorry, Amber, just yeah, I go ahead. Say my uh, email is on the page here. Oh, right. Um, so feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions, if you want to chat about something, um, if you want to collaborate in some way, uh, feel free to reach out. Awesome. Thanks, Lauren. Always a pleasure. Have Thanks a great everyone day, everyone. Thanks for coming today. All right. Bye.